are talking regenerative farming, which is of course way more sustainable. It adds all the right minerals and fungi and mycorrhiza, all of those things to the soil that feed the plants. So regenerative farming actually is much more than just earthworms and cover crops, although we need those. It's also about regrowing communities. And what we are talking about is a paradigm shift. In order to regrow communities, we have to have more farmers. And as I was just listening to Brad, it's super expensive to start farming. If generations of farmers are finding it hard to pass the farm on to their kids or grandkids, then I know we're in trouble. And on top of that, um, when the politics comes into place and the farmers are actually punished for farming the land and releasing carbon from the very soil we stand on. So, what I'd like to share with you today that we as consumers have much more power than we're led to believe. What's at the end of our fork impacts the food that we see in the grocery stores. And we can demand produce that's not only nutritional and tastes good, we can also make sure that it's safe to eat for our children. If you know that by the time a child is seven years old, it's probably collected more toxins than an adult did in the last few years. This is a problem. So, what I think I'd like to bring across that the diversity of our bodies ecologically is so important for our survival. And that diversity matches the incredible resilience and diversity that you find in healthy soil. It needs to retain water, it needs to have all of those, it needs to, as one farmer said, in five years of regenerative farming, and I will give you the link to see the whole documentary, his soil, when it was watered, instead of absorbing something like three inches, in an hour of watering, after regenerative farming and building the soil with more fiber, more, uh, I always get this wrong, I want to say hummus, but that's not it, it's humus. <laughs> Small difference. <laughs> and, and the water, the, the, actually the erosion is much less, the nutrients that the plants can have available, there is such a symbiotic relationship between what plants need, what we need, and what the soil keeps healthy. And um, my screen just flipped. So from, from here on in, and I was so hoping I didn't have to wing so much of it. But what I got excited about, there is actually very productive uh, data and there are groups of farmers that are binding together. And most of the information that I have gathered is from uh, Farm Footprint US. It's a huge, wonderful movement. And it actually educates farmers to get away from a system that's no longer working for them. If monocropping, I mean 10,000 acres of genetically modified corn has to exist on big subsidies from the government. Otherwise, they wouldn't be making it. And they get paid per acre. So the only way for them to pay for all the millions of dollars of equipment that it takes to till the soil and to work the soil and to till the soil again into practically industrial. Then that's the only way for them to make the payments for the fertilizer, for the seed. So, this is from a guy, Gabe Brown, and he's a good speaker. And uh, he's a North Dakota regenerative rancher and farmer. So he tells us that over 20 years of using regenerative principle 
his soil organic matter increased from 1.9% to 6.1%. So that is triple the amount of topsoil. And his water infiltration rates increased from half inch per hour to eight inches per hour. That's huge. I've been watering our, our garden that we actually I've been watering the heck out of our garden and we're on a well and fortunately it's a good well. And we live, we live out in Rinrod, so it's not known that whole region to have enough water. We can water like 20 minutes, half an hour at the time, then the well needs to catch up and we do more. So our early watering system happens early morning, late night or in the night and um, it penetrates and I was just so sorry to see it. This was the first year where we couldn't water enough to really, really soak the soil. And the produce is fine. It's working, but it's not thriving as it should. Like the outside perimeter of the garden, they're struggling. They really are. So. To preserve water, you need really, really good soil. And ever since my, my horse went, uh, we have to depend on others to bring in topsoil. You buy from green rod and they say, oh yeah, I've got fertilizer on it, but it's really just black diamond dust with some chicken manure added. And it's good for a couple of weeks, but it's not good to hold moisture. And no, Sarah said. <laughs> so, because we depend on our garden for our products, we grow our own beets. Beets are doing pretty well. We grow all our own kale and spinach and Swiss chard and parsley. And I was worried that I would have enough. It came back during the summer, but. The nice thing, and I think this is so important, I had farmers in the community connect with me. Hey, Afka, do you need extra kale? Yes, please. And we went to the farm. This is uh, Roots and Greens in Brindad, Heino and Manuela Peters. We just came up with a truck and we loaded up two truckloads full of kale. It was gonna be plowed under. Of course, we made the agreement I get it for a dollar a pound. Beautiful organic kale, not a blemish on it. But you know, the market wants perfect food all the time. So there we were, we phoned a couple of kids, <laughs> and we have some kids. We put them to work, and they all get a little bit of money, and the teenagers, they were just awesome. They organized the little ones, and before we knew it, two great big truckfuls of kale. They were washed, then processed, and put in buckets for a year's worth of harvest. So this is what community looks like when we are all working together with the farmers. What, I wrote them a check for, I think, $300 that would have gone in the soil. Now, it's not a waste to put it in the soil, but it's much better after you've grown it and planted it to get paid for it. Next week, he said, how are your zucchinis? Well, my zucchinis didn't want to start. It was too cold, some of the seed just rotted in the soil, and then it got too hot. The zucchinis wants moisture and warmth, but not heat. So, phone call. I have too many zucchinis, could you take some? Sure. He brought me 236 pounds of zucchinis. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful market zucchinis, but Stores can't have it. Last week he brought me, oh, I added some, some cucumbers to your zucchinis. He said, what's wrong with these? Well, I said, they're not perfectly straight. Said, Give me a break. What is wrong with the consumer? You know, apples have to be all the same size. Like, I listened with so much interest to Brad, because what he's facing, we're facing. But the good thing about our business that was just started as a little hobby 15 years ago. I wanted to do something different. <laughs> you know, maybe get some travel money, you know, play money. And that was, 
I guess it was just approaching 60. That was a big number, so it was time for a change. But that business is still thriving. And I think the secret of Okanagan Rossum really is that we can use below market looks, looking produce. And um, for us to become organically certified was really, really tough because those rules need to be changed too. I mean, we have to pay them $700 just to show them that we're honest. It, like, it never stops, yearly. And uh, most of the farmers that I know, they have so much integrity. There is so much passion into the, goes into the food that they market. Their heart's in it. And, and this is pretty much, I think, right across the board with, with farm personality. I grew up on a farm, farm kid. And I remember my dad saying all the time, the health of our cows depend on the health of our soil. And you know, of course, this was after the war years. And boy, did Europe have to work hard to feed the people. And I, I still get shivers when I think about that small little country that lost 30,000 people in just Amsterdam. Starvation, you can imagine. So, and the generation that knows this also has their eyes wide open, like Brad said, wake up, Paul, wake up, Paul. And it goes so many layers down the line where follow the science, well, it's not changing fast enough. It's, it's ruled by the elite that is, this is how it's always done. We cannot farm anymore like it's been done in the 50 years, 50 years ago. After the war, they were sitting in stockpiles of nitrogen. Guess what? Fertilizer. I remember my dad saying, wow, this is the cat's meow. Because all of a sudden, grass grew. Well, 50 years later, it didn't take long before some of the ditches went no more. I don't know what it's called, duck, something that's green stuff that grows on the ditches disappeared. A whole bunch of stuff disappeared. So to, go, to, to grow up like that, hard work, grow good food for the animals who will pay us back in turn. That is the cycle that has worked for many, many centuries. And we think that with the new innovative techniques of growing, monocropping, um, seed that is changed, you know, changing the DNA of a seed, I don't think that's a good idea. And I don't know if any of you wants to di discuss a glyphosate. It's a tragedy. And you see, glyphosate was developed to clean sewage pipes. That's the origin. Then they noticed that the runoff, it killed all the plants. So a lot of light goes on somewhere. So, and now there is barely a home in North America, for that matter, who does not have some Roundup, Brazil, selective herbicide, because as the soil depletes, weeds come in. Weeds are pretty hardy. So this has to change. And when I look at markets like Wildlife Farm, Roots and Greens, um, Doug Saba, Green Craft Gardens, when you go there, because that's right in my neighborhood, and a new young couple grew up, my, uh, Mara, they grow 5,000 kilo of carrots for us. Beautiful, big, juicing carrots. I know that soil. We see how they plant it. And I think because we see and we get to know our farmers, that people have recognized that how we treat food and how we want to bring it to them, there's trust. And we don't know what's going on in China. 
and we've had to switch gear a little bit in the last two years because there were shortages. Because we use some food that comes from what used to come from the prairies is now coming from Peru because our wholesale gets it in from Peru. And we are grinding our flax before we put this in here. And I turned the big food processor and said, Anna, why is this so dusty? So we checked the bag and what used to come from Western producers on the prairie, it now said Peru. So I phoned the wholesaler, what's going on? Like we built relationships with our wholesalers to uh, tie what's going on. They said, we couldn't get a new product with the Western producers for that price. So it's often the money because Canadian farmers, they have bigger wages than what's happening in Peru. And yes, it's USDA certified organic. You know, for every big container that comes in, they might check something, but we have no control over it. So when we have no control of where our food is coming from, I think that's a problem too. So the, the conversation about sustainability and food security, like I remember reading an article of, in, from England where it was the law that 60% of all the food had to come from the United Kingdom. That's now down to 30%. How does it make sense that good British pigs are exported for Chinese consumption while we get mass-produced piggies coming back? So, um, glyphosate, I think, needs to be discussed and it needs to be altered. I'm distressed that when some organic farmers want to get certified, but they can't because the farmer next door is growing GMO corn. We play golf in Grinrod regularly. Both sides of that little golf course, corn crops. It's really high at the moment. And uh, when you come in, or when I hit a ball in the cornfield, I crawl through the fence, and I can spot 25 others right there, not all mine. I can pick them up, there's not a weed to be seen. None. Bare, dusty looking soil. And this is beautiful river clay. It's only the fence line it has burdock and fish. <laughs> so this is not cool. On the other side of the golf course, there's a deep ditch that connects to the Shushwa. The runoff from those fields ends up in that ditch and it travels down the Shushwa River. The same thing happens in the US. The Mississippi collects so much fertilizer and glyphosate that there's dead zones the size of the state of Virginia. Fish die, nothing lives there. So what are we gonna do to change it? So I have some questions. And um, oh, the one thing, that, going back to my notes, I think totally, totally going off topic. Um, in the regenerative farming, this goes back to the story of uh, Gabe Brown, you get 78, 78 higher profits than conventional corn systems because of the savings and input. See, they had 29% less harvest, but what they found, because their cost of fertilizer and seed was so much down, at the end of the year, they made more money. And, you know, the consumer is told, organic food is expensive because the farmer charges too much. No. The store system automatically, when you market organic, they add another 10% above the 35% that they add to every single box. <laughs> that because
shops, they say, oh, the consumers, the organic consumers, they want it and they'll pay. We know this. The Whole Foods, we, we have our product in Whole Foods and Choices Market and uh, quite a lot of them all over the province and have big Sobeys that are big, big stores. And they tell us that their markup is 45%, so almost double, almost double. And we know that the farmers barely get 10 cents more. In the last probably six, seven years, the price of those carrots have gone up 10 cents a pound. Has the price of your produce and your groceries gone up? 10 cents. 10 cents a pound for the farm. And um, the price of beets, 15 cents a pound. They have the equipment, they put the time in, and, and the infrastructure. And most of these guys, they got their farm 25 years ago. I mean, Wildflight Farm has been going on for, I think, 27 years now. And to start over new, if you go to the Kootenays, to some of the farms over there, they lease land, they farm it quite regenerative. They have mixed cows, goats, you name it. To, to get the full benefit from the, the, the whole cycle of animals cropping, they do some intensive um, cow cropping where they put them in tall grass for two days and off they go. Finish off with some goats and chickens, off they go. And there's always a big green slant of grass. And then of course it's trampled down so all the fiber and the nutrients from these plants they just build topsoil up. And uh, the carbon tax for the farmer is just a disgrace, honestly. And Wheat production, it used to be, every, when we came to Canada, it was, one side was farmed, they were all kind of rows of like 20 feet was left to rest for a year, and then the next year, they'd switch around. There was always a rest period. Now, all of it. And that was because we had fertilizer. The corn, the, the oats, all of those, and the wheat, is about this high. It used to be four feet tall. So all that straw would go back in the soil. Now there's hardly anything that would go back in the soil. And that land is bare all winter long. So this is where carbon is going from the soil into the air. So if you cover it, you preserve it. And I find European countries, and I'll go back to the Netherlands where I grew up, um, for years now, it was demanded by the government that they put cover crops in. After the corn was harvested, they put cover crops in, turnips, anything green, to keep it green. And that was plowed in to make the soil ready again for next year's harvest. The nitrogen production in the Netherlands, like especially dairy areas, of course, they have this great amount of, uh, what do you call them, the manure pits under there, under there. They not spray it over the fields anymore, so that they run off in the ditches. They um, impregnate it under the, under the actual grass layer. So there's no runoff. Well, what I've just done this week, I wonder if this is going to be a little tricky because it's on and off, you know? Ah, okay, there we go. Um, what I did in my own garden last week, when I pulled out some beets and, and, and we had enough kale, pulled that out, I left it, and I 
lightly rototilled just to get it loose enough, I seeded sprouted buckwheat. Buckwheat is also a nitrogen enhancer and it's a beautiful, inexpensive uh, cover crop. And um, I'm not going to till it in. I'm just going to trample it. Like, and, and put some, you know, compost on it. Or if I can get some good cow manure, three inches of it. So, that's what I'm going to do. When do you turn in the buckwheat? Well, at the moment, it's this high. I, I did some about a month ago. It's this high and it's starting to bloom. I don't care. I'm going to trample it. The snow will do it for me, right? And then, so then in the spring, there's no black dirt to be seen anywhere in the garden. It looks so pretty when the whole garden is beautifully rototilled, or you see the big tractors out in the field, row upon row of beautifully manicured, open dirt. It sits there for six months. Just, so, exactly. So I don't know why Canada cannot ask for cover crops, because it would be so beneficial and it would keep our fields green much longer and it would most definitely delay the flu season because it is when the, when the green fields go brown after harvests like from corn especially that flu season starts because way more dirt goes out in the air. So those are just something everything is connected. We are an ecosystem right here and especially in our belly. And the more diversity we have, the more bacteria, the more varied our bacteria is, the better it is for us. We are not, we are not sterile people and we should never become sterile people. We thrive as diverse soil thrives. And we need to realize the symbiotic relationship that we have with dirt, with plants and how we all feed one another. Do we need to scrub every carrot clean? Do we need to incessantly wash our hands? Kids don't. Because it scrubs that protective mantle, the acid mantle of our skin. If you keep scrubbing that off, you're leaving yourself wide open to pick up whatever. So it is now well known that bacteria is something that we need. And you need to pick and choose. I think it starts up here. How strong and how resilient am I, really? Because we now know that our body listens. And the allergies that kids have, they're tough on the family. They really are tough. I have had mom stand in front of my little demo table sometimes I'm in a store and I listen to what people are worried about and what they want for their children and this kid can't have that like simple things like carrots simple things like peppers We've got cayenne in here oh pepper family it, it, the list is huge strawberries like healthy food right because they have a gut that's a leaky gut. The bacterial, what they call a symbiosis, isn't there. And so you need to replenish that in order for us to function again, for a digestive system to function well, there needs to be variety. One round of antibiotics will destroy not just the bad guys that you're taking it for, but a whole pile of good ones too. And often when I talk to people, when did this start? When did you get, you know, skin issues? He said, I was really sick and I was on a massive dose of antibiotics. And they were not able to replenish their good bacteria for months on end. And yogurt won't cut it. It's not enough. And some of the best things you can do is actually make your own sauerkraut. Not the stuff that you buy in the stores. I do a sauerkraut demo tomorrow. <laughs> Got great cabbages in <laughs> and, and those are not just things that really feed you, but the very act of making it and being proactive 
is like empowering to us as human beings. I, I feel like I'm doing something right for my body, and of course my body is going to respond to it. That's my logic. And to know that you can't trust your body to get over an illness or a flu, that's tough thinking, isn't it? We don't have to be so scared because we are beautifully and powerfully made. But we need to give our body like a hand by eating, you know, I, clean food is no longer good. It is like you need to eat quality food. And people often think that I'm a vegan, I'm a raw foodie. Well, I have been. And after two months of raw food, after I came home from California from the Culinary Arts Institute, I thought, you know what, I live in Canada, I don't want to eat raw food all winter long, this is silly. Uh, vegans, I guess you're not supposed to eat eggs and honey, and I'm thinking, that doesn't sound right to me. So, uh, then probably, I don't know, a good 10 years of vegetarian, no meat. And, uh, and then at some point, I, I cooked chicken for my husband and it smelled so darn good. <laughs> I think my body is trying to tell me something. So I added chicken, I added fish, but only organically free-range chicken that had had a good life. It's the same with fish. I eat some salmon, some trout when my husband goes fishing, but I need to know where it's coming from. That fish, that cow, that little piggy has been fed and treated well. Um, maybe, could you give like, uh, maybe three, your three best tips for soil health in your garden at home? Two, three, three, your best three tips for people who want to improve the soil health in their Well, <laughs> make good compost and mulch to conserve water. And we are getting some horse manure that has too much sawdust in it. That's hard because the decomposing of that eats up the nitrogen in the soil. Uh, the other one is leave some of those weeds in there as cover, but get them up before they make seed, right? And I throw some chickweed in my smoothies. Like, so it's there. It's always there, but it can get away with you. But compost, compost, and mulch. And put in a water system, a drip system. That is really the ticket. Yeah. What do you mean by mulch? Mulch, uh, old hay, plant matter. Um, if you cover it in soil, grass, 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 grass rippings, and um, yeah, I, I, I didn't get enough of it. It's when my animals left our acreage, I was in trouble with finding good mulch and manure for the garden. Now I have to go elsewhere, and I can't get it from the beef farmers or the dairy farmers. It, it's it, the glyphosate's in the manure. Do you have a question? So, how do you do this? How do I do this? How do you do this? You know, like to do a little bit of a garden with your front yard and put this in the house. And that's the way that it takes the Absolutely. I would say go to the organizations that know a lot and the best ones that I've seen and I was really wanting to um, really wanting to share that is hereforthepplanet.org. They have a wonderful, wonderful informational clips from the experts. Um, there are some garden growers that grow amazing gardens, small scale that certainly would feed six families. It's a start. You know, I would say start small-ish until you get the hang of it, until you know the soil. Have your soil analyzed and see if it's short minerals. Put a shovel in the ground and if you have to really stand on it with all your weight, you know, 
but it needs help. Um, so build the soil. Sometimes in the farm community, If you have, I know. Hay, old hay, like where you take the bales apart, you put that bunch of old hay on it. I had the privilege of getting wagon loads of that stuff, and I put it around the tomatoes between every row, and it was amazing. It lasted two years. This year, most of it was gone. And not gone, gone, but it was depleted again, and we struggled. And um, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, you have to pay for it. If you want to buy old hay, sometimes you're lucky a farmer has a pile sitting there that's not good food for cows anymore, and it's moldy. Talk to people, build a community. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, accessing local food, I think uh, Brad is phenomenal, and I know he does what he said here. You go there, how much local food he has available, it's not cheap, but he's absolutely right that we got used to getting our food far, far, far too cheap. If you go to China or India, a lot of the third world countries, sometimes 80% of their income goes to their food budget. We have traditionally, for the last 50 years, 20% of it goes to, to the groceries. And that's no longer sustainable. And our food comes from way, way, way too far. Like, I don't eat strawberries in the winter. I don't eat cantaloupes. I don't buy watermelons. I just, that's, no, cabbage is great with me. And local butchers we, we use. So this is where we need to go. We need to change the things and not eat kiwis from, from New Zealand. Like, that's not helpful. And it, it just keeps that crazy food system from all over the world that imported, flown in, keeps it alive. So what's at the end of our fork or on our plane, plate, in the winter time, eating local, eating seasonal, and build communities, I think, that's where we'll shine in the end. And I think we've got everything right around here and the willpower of people. Like, I can't believe, you know, what's happening at this fair, what was happening in Armstrong. People are aware. And I think that's the first clue. If you're not aware, then there's no problem. But if you open your eyes, you start looking together for solutions. And that's where the ticket is. And there's amazing information available. So Farm Footprint US, amazing videos of all types of questions. I think they'll answer a lot of your questions and we'll get excited about growing food again. And then the other one that I said earlier was soil, soil food web. And that is for hereforthepanet.org. And then you go to soilfoodweb.com. And they are, there's resources everywhere. And one of my favorite, I don't know what my time is, one of my favorite lecturers in the United States is a medical doctor, Zach Bush. He is part of the Food Network and for Regenerative Farming. And phenomenal how he ties it all together. A wonderful, wonderful educator that um, will paint a beautiful future. Quick note, as I said earlier, we are starting a um, community kind of bulk buying system where you can go, you can grab a couple of um, those little pamphlets where you can buy things in bulk, where we have organic, um, uh, my brain is shutting down, <laughs> where we have organic flowers, ever flowers, all the traditional flowers, we have organic rice, yogurt, and, and beans and rice and nuts and seeds, but in large bags, 
and whether you team up with other people, that's totally cool, but it's pickup only. We can't distribute, but we get it from the wholesaler. Traditionally, you'll probably save 20, 30% on average. And every time something is reduced in size in the stores, it doubles the price. That's where the prices are. Well, thank you so much, Happy. Oh. Okay, thank you again. And we um, have some uh, dried apples from Peterson's Farm um, that we have for you. Um, and uh, we would like to just acknowledge all the people who came and listened as well. And all this information will also be available on YouTube afterwards. So. And after we'll be here. <laughs> Afka, I've got a blank. Afka will be here again tomorrow and Sunday. Yes. So she's going to share with us um, making sauerkraut. And, and what is the, the last one is? I think it'll, it'll be a mixed match of preserving food. Preserving food. There is here I as well. Right, and there's also um, free seeds at our booth. I know we'd like to take some. It's, I mean, it's getting a bit late, <laughs> but you can put them in your freezer and use them next year. Um, so yeah, we encourage everyone to try growing stuff at their home.